Okay. All right. So in 2002, we kind of noticed that the forage oat trial here had some regrowth. Now, it didn't necessarily look like there was going to be enough um, material out there to go out and take a second hay crop. But if you had a fence or would, could put up a hot wire quite easily, um, there was definitely enough um, material there for us to, to do some grazing. Um, we had also... Um, so we took the forage oat variety trial in 2003, and we harvested. It was planted on May 2nd, and we harvested it at the early milk stage on uh, would have been in mid July, and so we took off about three tons per acre uh, as forage oats. And then we noticed that we had the regrowth, and we let that go. And in the middle of August, we came back, and we quantified that. So we know how much material was out there in case somebody did actually want to turn cows out and, and graze uh, almost half a ton of leaf okay. production. Again, this is dry matter. And if we look over at the far right, you can see that we average between about a ton and three quarters to just over a ton and a quarter of leaf production over the season and we did take and dig up a portion of the turnips to get a root yield and we see that the one purple top which Kevin had talked about earlier does quite a bit of root production compared to some of the other ones um, we pulled off a ton of roots in the purple top and a ton and a quarter in the globe turnips Now here's the trial that we really thought saw a real good fit for the livestock producers. Um, it's a forage oat trial, and at the same time we underseeded it with a bunch of different uh, other crops. If we go down the list, we just use Paul oats because we like Paul, gives you good quality forage. Um, then we underseeded it that bark, bark ant is a turnip, the barnapoli is a rape, the Bernina is a vetch. The Berninova is a vetch. Dwarf Essex is a rape. Green Spirit is Italian ryegrass. Puna is chicory, and that's in the looks like the it's in the dandelion family, so it looks like giant dandelion leaves. Um, Purple Top is a turnip, and then we also did the winter cereals: winter rye, winter spelt, winter triticale, and winter wheat. So this was planted May 13th. Our first harvest was on July 11th, and that was fully headed oats. And we got about two and a half tons per acre off as, as oat hay. Now we did have a little bit of regrowth. Uh, our next harvest was on August 19th. The oats that were left were early milk stage. And if you see at the very top row that Paul oats, we had about half a ton of oat regrowth. So all the numbers below that, anything above that half ton is what that underseeded cover crop uh, produced. So some of them look pretty promising. That turn up there, we got another almost, you know, not quite half a ton. Um, winter triticale, we got almost half another half a ton out of it. Then we let this grow again, and we took a third harvest, October 10th, which is, you know, you could take cows off a of pasture then when your forage quality is going down, and we could turn them out onto this trail. Now, we did get some things that did not survive and did not regrow for this third third harvest, but that bark nap turnip, we got another three quarters of a ton of yield out of it. The dwarf Essex rape, we got 0.58 tons. Here's a pretty interesting one, that Italian ryegrass, we all got almost another ton of production from August 19th to October 10th. And then the winter cereals looked pretty promising as well. We got three quarters of a ton of forage with the rye. 
0.6 tons with the spelt, half a ton with the winter triticale, and uh, three quarters of a ton with the winter wheat. So over at the right column, we'll give you a total total yield for all three cuttings for the different treatments. Now, interesting thing that, like Kevin pointed out, here we didn't we did look at the next season just to see how many of these things would overwinter because we do have some biennials in here and we have the winter cereals. But we did take this at October 10th and we did cut it down at uh, about two inch cutting height. So we didn't have much residue left out there to overwinter. So the only thing that did overwinter was the winter rye. And we were able to harvest that um, mid-June and we pulled off between a ton and three quarters and two tons of rye forage the next season. And that would have been, you would have had time to go in and plant another annual forage. You could have potentially tried a late season soybean or sunflowers, but Kevin did mention the allelopathic effects of rye, so we didn't, we didn't do that. That's something we're going to try and look forward to in the future. Um, another good fit, especially if you guys grow field peas and aren't uh, totally averse to tillage, uh, is a, what my boss Blaine likes to call a field pea relay cover crop. And we come in after you combine and we'll do light disking on the peas. So you're going down probably about two inches with a harrow. And this slide here shows a survey of three fields in 2008. There's different fields that were seed field pea seed production fields and we just went in and dissed them after combining and we came back and um, we take a biomass sample usually between oh the 10th to 20th of October and we got 3,000 pounds on one field where we had a little more throw over with the combine one field that was really quite clean, very little throw over in the combine. We had 1,500 pounds of production. And then a, kind of an average one there, we had 1,800 pounds, almost 1,900 pounds of production. And with the protein content averaging, well, the total nitrogen, not protein, the nitrogen content in this um, residue or above ground growth was about 4%. So we ended up with 130 pounds of nitrogen, 63 pounds, 70 pounds of nitrogen produced in just the above ground portion of those um, plants. Uh, if you look at the handout our previous speaker had later on, he has a lot more information on this material. He shows a lot of the roots. We have tremendous nodule nodulation in these plants. Probably three to four times as much nodulation as you get in your spring spring. Um, your actual grain crop that you took. Now we've been doing this for quite a few years. Our four year average on all these different pea fields is running right at a ton an acre produced each year. Um, one year we took a 16 acre field and we fenced that. The peas were harvested August 10th. They were disked on the 20th. On the October 15th we turned in 52 cows for, and we grazed them for 21 days, and their estimated dry matter production per acre was 2,800 pounds. And Kevin gave you a lot of the forage quality on this. So these past two seasons, we turned around and we put a test crop on top of this. Um, we had field peas that we didn't do anything to, and then we had two different rates um, basically, the one was a pretty clean field at six six seeds per square foot. Is if you know if you do a pretty good job of setting the combine, and if you want to do a little more cover crop, or you did, you're like me, you don't set the combine quite as good as you probably could. Um, we get a little over a ton of production in that scenario. Um, total nitrogen produced above ground when we don't do anything, you're looking at 13 pounds that lower seeding rate we produce 72 pounds of nitrogen and the higher seeding rate we produce 88 and a half pounds of nitrogen. Now the next column is just how green this machine measures the greenness of the leaves and it's 
is supposed to correlate with the amount of um, nitrogen in the plant. But what the most interesting thing is, is what everybody is most interested in is our yield. So if we didn't do anything to the peas, we had 54 pound wheat. If we incorporated at that low, lower seeding rate, um, we ended up with 56 and a half pound or bushel peas. And at the higher rate, we had almost 60 bushel peas. Wheat, sorry, sorry, thank you. Um, we're going to move forward. Those are the two things that I look, I see a lot of potential for. Um, I'm going to go over some of the trials that we had here at Carrington this season. This first one is uh, what we call the USDA cover crop trial. This would have been drilled directly after wheat harvest and it got to be a little late here so this was seeded about the 27th of August and we had different treatments. We had black lentil at 40 pounds, we had oats at 58 pounds an acre, the German foxtail millet at 30 pounds, cowpeas at 40 pounds, radishes at six pounds and then we had uh, these diverse mixtures and this past season we got them in kind of late at that third week of August and we were cool and we were dry here at Carrington and you can see uh, our production here per acre is, is quite low in October we went out and took a sample and they range anywhere from 18 to 430 pounds. And in the November column, we did not um, we did not go back and harvest the same area. We came back and, and took a different area. So it's not it's not a combination of the two. And it shows you um, just kind of how it wasn't exactly uniform across there. And we had. Little or no uh, dry matter gain from October through November, just was cold and we had snow here at Carrington. We had another uh, trial right next to that where we looked at different seeding timings and it was the same scenario. We seeded cover crops at, at the five to six leaf stage, at heading on the wheat, and then we went in, that was a broadcast seeding and we came in and drilled directly after harvest. Same time frame as this trial. Um, basically the same mixtures and kind of the same results. It was just kind of a poor year here at Carrington. It was just dry and cool and very little production. Um, Ron Wiederholt is looking at uh, did a couple little demonstrations here and also at Burley County and we were able to get some good pictures of how this might might look. Um, he's looking at drilling cover crops between the rows on soybeans and and corn. And Susan Musk Musky of Dickey Lamore County that was able to give us some real nice pictures on how that looked. Ours were pretty scraggly. Uh, they looked at the timing of V5 corn, which is about the last time you could cultivate it, or the last time you could get through here with a planter without snapping the, snapping them off. Um, soybeans, they're just trying to do it just prior to leaf drop. And there's different methods that you can do. We, in this scenario, we drilled everything. Um, I've seen it broadcasted and I've seen guys aerial, aerial seed it in other parts of the country. Um, Ron also has a study with SDSU, Stutzman County, and Burley County. They're looking at what they're calling precision cover crops. They're trying different cover crops um, at different well, they're testing it over different positions in the landscape and seeing if there's any effect there on the cover crop production as well as the crop production. And they had limited cover crop production this year. And as they would expect, their corn test crop, you know, it did poorest on the summit, you know, wasn't too bad on the back slope, and their best yields were on the toe slope where they had more, mo the most moisture. This one's pretty busy. Um, it's just 
something we came up with. Um, since salinity seems to be a big issue as well, we could also look at these in a, you know, a PP, a prevent plant acre scenario. So we did a large cover crop demonstration on a couple saline sites in Foster and Stutzman County and numerous, numerous um, different types. We've got legumes, both perennial and annual, um, warm seasons and cool seasons, and then we have um, broadleafs as well, both cool and warm season broadleafs, and then annual grasses as well, um, both warm and cool seasons. And here's a Here's a picture of the trial. This is right south of uh, the Buchanan Bar, right there off east of Highway 281. This is facing southwest, looking over the trial towards uh, the town of Buchanan. And the interesting thing that we found there, as far as the cover crop goes, is that the barley, um, sugar beets, and mangles, which are an unimproved sugar beet, they were our best uh, best production. And they we were able to successfully establish in ECs from five and a half to six. So, and this coming season we're going to repeat this study and we're this, unfortunately this last season we did not clip um, biomass production this coming season we will. And with that, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions that anyone has. Question? Yes, sir. Did you use any chemical weed control on your portico? No, no. Repeat the question. The question was, did we use any chemical weed control on the forage oats? No, we did not. None whatsoever. How expensive is the sugar beet? How expensive is the sugar beet seed? Well, ours wasn't too expensive because they gave us old seed, and the germ doesn't hold very well, from what I understand, in the sugar beet seed. So we got two- and three-year-old seed, and we did a germination test ourselves to try and figure out, you know, because it wasn't even remotely close to what the bag said it was going to be. So it was... 40, 40 to 50 percent in the bag said it was supposed to be 90. But prices, um, I will look that up for you. I don't know. Do you know off the top of your head, Tim? A lot of the sold sugar beet seeds are in about a uh, buck a pound. Okay. Tim said that he's, he's had experience with it, and this old sugar beet seed's running about a buck a pound, he said. Find it. Yeah, if you can find it. Are there any questions from out in the different sites. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you for you the opportunity. Sir.